<laughs> yeah. So this is awesome. Okay, cool. We have a very, very interesting topic today. It's about Google Shopping and how you can defend um, once you've made it in Google Shopping because it's a really, really hard marketplace to be in, right? So there's a lot of competition. Um, not sure if you're going to talk about CSS today, but um, you know, there's a lot of competition in the market. And once you've made it, you have to defend that position. And that's something Mike is going to talk to us about today. And he's an absolute expert about uh, in, in the topic of Google Shopping because he's the the product manager for the Google Shopping Management Solution at Whoop. So he sees so many, so many different accounts. And he's also, also published on PPC Hero, Search Engine Land, and been featured on events like the SMX and e-commerce expo. So you know, he's somebody you can actually, you know, get tangible stuff that actually works. And especially Google, Google Shopping, there's not much you can just find online. You know, it's really um, you have to be very experienced to talk about it. So I'm very happy to have you here, Mike from Boston but now living in Austria and doing this session in English. Next time we're going to do it in German. I'm just kidding, but this is going to be amazing. So um, yeah, the stage is yours. I'm going to be here all the time. I'm just going to be not visible. And if there's any issues, I'll come on stage, help you out, and we'll do all the, the questions in the chat, or you can come on stage at the end of the presentation if you like. If you want to ask a question, that'd be a first. I'd love that. That would be so amazing. And if you want to write your question in German, no problem. I'm pretty sure Mike can read it anyway, but I will yeah. translate it um, just for the English listening audience. All right, Mike, the stage is yours and uh, happy to have you. See you in a minute. So thanks so much for the introduction. And um, yeah, thanks also for accommodating me in English. Um, I do speak and understand German, but um, it's a lot better if I speak in English generally. So um, as mentioned, I'll be talking about Google Shopping and marketplaces today. Um, before we jump into that, um, I'm just going to also give a quick intro on myself. So, I mean, as I see it, I kind of, I'm in this really fortunate position. I get to stand on the shoulders of giants in so many ways because I work at this company where we have several hundred um, clients and this gives us just a huge amount of um, exposure to what's going on on the market. And we have so many talented people working within these accounts. And I'm really fortunate in, in that I get to benefit from a lot of that and help share it um, on the market with, with all of you. Um, so just about this agenda, please excuse me if I look to the other screen, my display here is mirrored, so it's backwards English. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll be discussing three e key e-commerce trends, so kind of a higher level um, assessment, my opinion of what's going on on the market recently and what will go on. Um, then I'm going to talk about how marketplace business models work at a high level, um, and also talking about how marketplaces can implement Google Shopping because this is a pretty strange topic actually. Um, and then I'll also get into implications for um, classic retailers who do not have a marketplace business model, um, what it's like to have marketplaces in the auction with them. Um, so in regards to these three trends, the first one I wanna start with is what I call the EKG effect. Um, patent pending, not trademark term. No, but the EKG here I'm referring to an electrocardiogram. And when you think of your heart rate, you know, going boom, 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 and you see that that electric uh, graph, uh, that chart of your heart rate, there's this classic spike quality. And um, yeah, uh, just a, a few headlines that you've probably seen is that the e-commerce market grew a monumental amount in a period of weeks, a period of months, last spring due to COVID, all these offline closures happened and it really enforced e-commerce growth. People had no choice but to go online and shop. And so it crafted a lot of new behaviors and people who hadn't done that before. And um, yeah, definitely the market grew a lot. But what I find is often missing is conversations about what happens after that. And that's what I mean with this EKG effect. Um, we can see that the, the, um, the market grew this is US data, please excuse me, I couldn't find good reliable German data, this is from eMarketer, but I think it's anyway representative. The market grew 32%, which is pretty astonishing. Um, in previous years, it was more like 14% um, around there. Um, but now this year in 2021, or that's debatable, but let's say for the purposes of this in 2021, this growth is going to contract, it's going to pull back a bit, down to 6% or so, that's what eMarketer forecasts. Um, I think this will depend on how long the, the lockdown situations really last in different markets, but I do think that this pattern we see here will be applicable to most markets. 
And what it, what it means to me is that um, year over year comparisons are going to be very challenging when 6% growth would be a benchmark for the year. And last year, your benchmark was 32% in e-commerce. This makes it very confusing. And you can't even really compare to 2019 either because that would have been 15% or so. Um, so we're, we're dealing with a really changed landscape um, where the basically the market grew, but it already ate up some of this year's growth. Um, another key trend is that the bigger going to get bigger. This is already happening for a while now, and I see this as accelerated by what's going on in COVID. So here you can see data from 2017 to 2019, where we can see that um, the top 100 uh, merchants in Germany, and here's the top 100 in the United Kingdom, they were already outpacing their respective market averages of 19% growth in Germany, 12% in the UK. They were already outpacing these, um, in some cases quite significantly. And that means that they're grabbing more and more market share. If they're growing faster than the rest of the market, then they must be taking more and more market share. And it starts putting pressure downstream in the market to have these very large players growing faster. Um, and this accelerated in COVID-19, uh, due to COVID-19. And the third trend that I want to discuss is what I call market placeification. Um, so the increased adoption of marketplace business models. Um, and here, uh, this is actually pulled from a slide that I created back in like um, April maybe of last year, early in the COVID crisis. Um, so I've ripped some headlines from the for, that were current at the time. Um, and now I would say that only one of these things is true. The one that I want to point out is not true. Online marketplace is tanking worldwide, except for Amazon. It's true that Amazon grew massively. Amazon had a very good year, but other marketplaces absolutely did not tank. Um, let's keep this phrase collapse of the middle in the mind. I'm going to bring that up again in a second. But just here in the German market, um, we can see that you know there's long-standing regional marketplaces like Zalando and, and others, but um, we see that more and more classic retailers are expanding into marketplace models. Um, in the case of the, the Schwarz Group that owns um, Lidl, they actually purchased uh, Real.de and rebranded it as Kaufland, so they're, uh, they're acquiring. And we just see that um, marketplace business model adoption is increasing. And uh, I think it'll become clear why when we get to the business model. Uh, but before we get too far into that, I um, just want to share my perspective on what the convergence of these three trends means. Um, I, I actually, I think, I think of myself as an optimistic guy and a, and a risk taker, but sometimes I have pessimistic views, you could say. I, I just think when we see that, um, that year-over-year -year growth is going to be flatter this year and diminished in the next years because a lot of that growth happened already. Um, and when we see that the biggest players are outpacing the rest of the market, they're growing faster, they're taking market share. And when we see that marketplaces are proliferating and um, this is actually feeding into that trend of consolidation, it strikes me that this could be a pretty tough year, tough couple years, for people who are more positioned in the in the middle, what Steve Dennis refers to as the collapse of the retail middle. Um, collapse is a strong word, but I think that there's going to be unprecedented pressure on those business models um, in terms of pricing, in terms of margin, in terms of customer experience, uh, because in the end, they're going to need to compete with the value propositions of marketplaces, which are quite strong. They tend to be around excellent customer experiment, experience, fulfillment, convenience, um, price, and these topics. So let's get into that marketplace business model quickly. I'll keep this high level, it's just one slide. In case you're not familiar with what makes marketplaces a little bit different from classic retailers, um, there are three main metrics that I think help illustrate the way that they work. The first of those is gross merchandise volume. This is often called the revenue of a, uh, of a marketplace, but it's, it's actually not revenue. It's the size of the marketplace. It's the size of all of the sales volume that occurs in that marketplace. 
And this is very interesting for investors because it helps them understand how big of a marketplace they're dealing with. And typically marketplaces are backed by venture capital and investors. So it's, it's a bit of a vanity metric, but it's nevertheless, it's very important for them um, to, to grow. And we'll come back to it on point three when we get there. Um, but their actual revenue comes in the form of the take rate, also called the rake. And this is kind of their commission and their fees that they earn on sales. Because of the total sales volume that exists in the marketplace, they're capturing just a percentage of that through the commissions. Um, and this is actually more like the way their revenue is. And that's not to be confused with profit because then they'll have to remove different, um, different costs there, their customer acquisition costs in terms of um, acquiring new sellers, in terms of acquiring um, new, new consumers as well. Um, they have a lot of customer acquisition, traffic acquisition costs and other kinds of operating costs. Um, the third metric that I'd like to highlight is liquidity, um, which is basically the the network effect of of a of a of a marketplace. It's the balance between supply and demand. And what they're trying to do in a marketplace is basically like a critical mass challenge, or, or often called a flywheel effect. They want to get this certain momentum that can be very challenging to build at first, but once it's there, super powerful. And that's where there is a huge amount of offers um, in terms of range of products for sale, in terms of sellers offering those products. This creates a breadth and a depth to the environment. And this creates a very attractive experience for consumers. And meanwhile, they need a large volume of consumers demand in order to attract the supply, the sellers. They have to carefully balance these two things. It's kind of like you could say it's a bit like a ballet dance. It's also a bit like um, a python trying to swallow a deer or something like that. It's 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 this monumental undertaking, um, and it's it's the main thing that they need to achieve as a marketplace in order to survive. Um, and gross merchandise volume basically shows the sum of what's going on there. It shows the sum of uh, offers and the conversion of those offers, the matching of those offers to consumers in the form of sales. Um, so how can marketplaces use uh, Google Shopping? This is uh, kind of an interesting topic in my opinion. Um, it's, it's really Google Shopping is not actually designed for marketplaces. That's the fundamental thing. Google Shopping is a product listing um, channel. It's a performance marketing channel, that's that's clear, but it has a product structure. And um, in the end, what Google basically requires from marketplaces is to bring a seller-oriented structure into the account. And there's some kind of an inherent conflict here, um, which I think Google knows about and they're working on addressing. But <clears throat> let's um, dig into that in a little more detail. Um, the way uh, a lot of marketplaces that I've spoken with um, have started out is with a kind of classic um, merchant center or merchant center aggregator. But what they what they actually need to do actually to be compliant with Google um, is and to avoid problems in the long run, they need to adopt a marketplace MCA. And this is structured a bit differently than others. Um, there's a catch all account, which we'll get into the details of a bit later. And then there are accounts for every different seller. And this is designed to be big and the structure can be made bigger upon request, but it's also incredibly nested, incredibly hierarchical. Um, it, it splits up data into potentially a lot of different places and there are challenges about that. Um, now, when migrating to from a standard merchant center to a marketplace um, MCA, it's really important to do this at a non-sensitive time period. Um, outside of key dates because it can be pretty bumpy. Um, it can cause disruptions to bidding technology and it can even cause downtime for a period of days. Um, so there are two main ways of approaching this. I'll tell you the official one first and then I'll tell you uh, another one. I don't know. Let's see if Google gives me a slap on the wrist about it. Um, the official way is to do a standard marketplace MCA creation and this is basically just creating a new one from scratch. So 
Um, you just follow a pretty standard process. You can talk to Google about creating this special kind of MCA for you. Um, it's possible to do it on your own um, online, but I would definitely get Google involved to help you out. Um, and important to know that your email address can't be associated with any existing merchant centers. Um, and then once you um, get a standalone merchant center created, you can get it converted into a marketplace MCA and you'll receive um, confirmation of that and you'll get your first catch all account. Um, so this is like kind of straightforward, but it has some, some advantages and disadvantages. Uh, it's a less risky way because it's the proper way to do it. Um, it's, there's, there's less risk of downtime um, where, because if you have an existing account, the existing account stays live and uh, the new account is created in the meanwhile. Um, and the drawback, though, is that this account will have no item history, and that can be uh, pretty damaging because, yeah, you lose all of the performance history that you've had before. Um, your, your bidding technology, whatever you lose, is use will, will lose that data and have to start from, from start, and uh, that's something to definitely be mindful of. Um, so, you know, we, we recently worked with uh, a UK marketplace who found this solution more or less unacceptable. Um, and we worked with them and with Google to create a custom solution. So I can't guarantee you that Google will do a custom solution for you if you are a marketplace, but I think anyway, this is an interesting topic, even if you're not a marketplace, to see how this goes. So <clears throat> when creating a custom migration, um, <clears throat> you, rather than creating a new MC and converting it into an MCA, you convert the target merchant center directly into this catch-all within, um, within a marketplace MCA. And Google engineering needs to get involved to do this because there's no standard way of doing this. It has to be done by Google engineering. Um, now, <clears throat> there's also a topic about if you're changing your domain, for example, um, let's say that you, I can show this in another slide, you'll see a little more detail, but uh, the, the best practice here would be to try to use a global domain, not a, a regional domain, um, or try not to have any domain updates um, on your URL. This could be challenging. Um, and then you can start linking seller accounts into the new account, uh, the new merchant center aggregator at that point. So I'll, I'll make this a little more concrete with a diagram in just a minute. Um, but the benefits here are that you retain your current item history, which is huge, and um, you can build on your existing portfolio with, um, if you're using Target Rose or if you're using another um, bidding solution, a third party solution, whatever approach that you take. Um, there will be a temporary impact that's to be expected. And if you modify the URL, this can definitely result in downtime. So you have to be careful about that. So just to explain again how this looks, and in a diagram form. This was again for a UK merchant or marketplace. And um, what, they, what they did here was to um, create a, a merchant center, merchant marketplace merchant center for Europe and one for the rest of the world. And in the first place, everything is located, all of their offers are located in the catch all, but Google doesn't want this. Google's target is that you have less than 1% of your traffic as weighted by clicks um, living in this catch-all and everything else should go through your sellers. So there's a, a limit of 20,000 sub accounts possible by default. That means a limit of 20,000 sellers that can be associated with a given marketplace. Um, for most people, this shouldn't be a problem right away, um, but for larger marketplaces, this can be a challenge. And there are also item quotas um, so that's 40 million items for this catch-all, um, 150,000 for each of these sub-accounts for each seller. There's a, there's a maximum of 150,000 items that they can have. And in sum, this can't exceed more than 50 million. So we've working, we're working with this UK marketplace and they've sized up repeatedly with Google. They're now at like 150 million um, limit so that they have some comfortable ceiling above them. And um, yeah, they, Google can grow this with you as, as, your, as your marketplace grows, um, but it's definitely, it just takes a tight feedback with Google. You're going to need to find someone there who's reliable, someone who really understands the, the setup 
um, if you're working with an agency partner, you need to make sure that they're on board with this too, because this is very different than um, standard Google Shopping, and it can be challenging. Um, but to sum that up in best practices here, um, you should work with a catch-all that has basically 1% of, of the marketplace's click activity, not sales activity, not the gross merchandise volume. Um, but Google's not going to strictly enforce this right away. They know that this is challenging. Um, you're constantly onboarding new sellers and then you need to be breaking them out. So the best practice is to add into, um, into your long tail, excuse me, add your long tail sellers. Like for example, um, you'll probably have a lot of very small sellers who don't have a lot of offers. You can move all of those into your catch-all um, and generally you just need to keep breaking out sellers as your catch-all is hitting limits. Just keep breaking out sellers, breaking out sellers and take it bit by bit. Um, now I'm going to get back to a more traditional area of Google Shopping and talk about implications and actions for retailers, what it means for retailers to operate alongside marketplace MCAs and marketplace business models in the Google Shopping auction. Um, one thing I just want to remind on is that, again, these marketplaces are not optimizing for the same goals as a classic retailer. They have different metrics in place. They, have, they don't have revenue, profit. They're working with gross merchandise volume. They're working with their take rate. And this, they often, as I said, they often have investors backing them, um, and growth is their prime directive. This is like breathing air for them. They need to grow as much as possible, as fast as possible. They are chasing this um, not impossible dream, but this very challenging dream of getting these huge network effects uh, where basically each, each new customer and each new seller um, it's not one plus one equals two anymore. It's one plus one equals three or one plus one equals five. These are the effects that they ultimately want to achieve with this marketplace. So marketplaces tend to be really aggressive in the Google shopping auction. <clears throat> and we'll use um, Amazon as an example here. And they also, Amazon, for example, they, they're optimizing for prime subscri subscriptions as well. That's something else to remember. They're, they're playing a different game. And this is why their bids are so high. This is why they're so aggressive. This is why they're so challenging to coexist with for a classic retailer. <clears throat> this is a framework that I highly recommend for evaluating competitors. It's not limited to just marketplaces. You can use this to evaluate any competitor marketplaces. You may also use this to evaluate your competitors. Um, <clears throat> But in a nutshell, it's based on the auction insights from the shopping report or your search report. Um, and here we can see on the y-axis is outranking share, which is basically how often you are outranking a given competitor. Um, and we also see the overlap rate, which is how often you are in the same auctions as a given competitor. Uh, the bubble radius in this, in this bubble chart indicates the impression share of a given competitor where impression share typically is a signal of the robustness or the size, the aggression level, how effectively a competitor is, is advertising themselves in their assortment, how much of their, of their possible eligible impressions are actually able to capture. Um, so when we use these metrics in the form of a quadrant analysis, I think it becomes pretty interesting because you can see then um, <clears throat> that there are these different areas where competitors can live. If they're overlapping with you all the time, they're in all the same auctions as you, and they're outranking you all the time, um, like this big bubble in the upper right-hand corner, this is a very powerful competitor, very dangerous, and you need to think, it depends on your outlook too. Do you want to attack here? Can you afford to? Do you want to retreat from that kind of competition? How do you want to react? Um, meanwhile, if we would have still a very high outranking share, but less overlap rate, like we see in the upper left-hand quadrant, um, this is a little bit less risky. So yes, they're very powerful at outranking you, but you're not bumping heads with them as often. Um, so there's a little, there's, there's lower risk here. There's more that you can do in terms of um, exploring that area. 
Um, down in the lower right hand quadrant, you've got, uh, you're, you're outranking them quite a lot, um, <clears throat> but you're overlapping with them all the time. So that means they're there, they wanna be there. You're outranking them now, but you wanna defend that area. That's, that's kind of your territory. And then this is the sweet spot where you are <clears throat> outranking them, you have a high outranking, you're outranking the competitor a lot, um, and you don't overlap with them that much when you do cross pass. So this is an area where you can safely invest and you can add budgets, um, you can pursue some different goals perhaps. And <clears throat> here's just a, um, a color graph version of the same chart. You know, this is the danger area in, in this whole corner of the chart and this is kind of the sweet spot. And this corridor in the middle um, is a little bit more ambiguous, but I also, I always had a fifth quadrant, so to say, to any quadrant analysis, uh, because things that exist here in the middle, it's just not clear what's happening there. Um, so I wanna bring this to life with several examples. We're gonna move from a higher level <clears throat> at um, really kind of a, an industry level down through an account and then into an ad group level within a given account. Um, so this is a, an older illustration, but I still love it uh, because this was a crucial period in time in the history of Amazon in the Google Shopping option. Um, we can see that back in January of 2018, for example, um, Amazon was, was very weak in the, in the auction at that point. So, I mean, they had good outranking, actually. Um, they, this is an inverse outranking share here. Um, so they were tending to outrank across these different industries, but their impression share was very low. So it seems like they were testing. They were figuring out the environment, they were getting a taste, seeing perhaps which products are going to perform best, <clears throat> getting a feeling who's out there, how does this whole Google Shopping thing work? Maybe they were getting their crazy um, marketplace MCA structure up and running. I think they must be on the phone with Google every day about that. Um, but here they were in that area. And yeah, they were bidding strong, but on a narrow part of their assortment. Then everything changed. You know, we fast forward almost a year later and in December, it was really around um, November of 2019 that they just flipped the switch and it just went crazy. Um, and they've been extremely dominant since then. These industries, by the way, in case the font is rather small, electronics in green, sports in orange, fashion in blue, office in purple, and books and media in red. Um, so these are some core industries for Amazon. <clears throat> um, this data is based on, it's based on the average um, metrics for Amazon from um, 25, 20 to 25 accounts in each of these industries. Um, so it gives us a picture of how powerful uh, Amazon became in the Google Shopping auction and how disruptive they became uh, because they just moved overnight from, okay, over here, yeah, I'm outranking, but we're not present that often to just outranking all the time in a lot of auctions um, with a huge impression share. So across tons of products. Um, now I'd like to zoom into the office supply one um, in just a moment, because as you can see, they're basically most dominant in office supply. This is the area where they're absolutely strongest. So I thought that would be a really interesting industry to look at. Um, before we get there, just to sum up these, these KPIs here, I mean, they have up to 66% impression share, which is quite strong, um, up to 70% overlap rate, and what's most painful, up to 85% outranking, meaning that they're going to be in you know, the leftmost PLA, they'll be in strong positions in, in, the, in the PLA unit. Um, and they do this through a loss leadership strategy, I would guess. Um, they um, are optimizing for probably different metrics like prime subscriptions or gross merchandise volume or whatever the case may be, but they have the resources to do this. And that's what they've done. Um, so last year, they disappeared from the Google Shopping auction for a while because of the impact of COVID on their business. And this is from SMX London in May last year. Um, these were my tips about how to prepare for, for re-entry. In other words, okay, Amazon's not in the auction. What should I do now to, um, to get ready for when they come back? 
And now I kind of want to test this advice or dig into it a little more because back in May, I just presented this advice kind of at face value like that. Let's get into a little more detail now. Um, I definitely recommend granular um, campaign structuring. It depends what your approach is. Um, there are definitely benefits to more consolidated accounts, especially if you're using um, Google Automation, it can be, can be smart. If you're using a third party tool um, that helps you achieve a granular account structure, you might wanna go that way. Um, but what I wanna look at in more detail here are query funneling, query level strategies, um, and margin and price data and uh, using these things. So um, I want to really challenge my own advice <laughs> and say, all right, great. I said that I think that Amazon probably is brute forcing the auction and they probably have a very bad approach to queries. Um, is this true or not? So also I want to check what about device campaign splits because I just think that Google bids high all the time, every time, and that this creates opportunity for people. It makes them very strong on the one hand, but it's like this idea of um, David versus Goliath or um, a fleet of very powerful naval ships versus some kind of more, or like guerrilla warfare, that kind of topic. Um, so I dug into an account here. This is um, a, a German office supplier, a classic retailer, not a marketplace. Um, in the month of January this year. And I wanted to look at how Amazon looks for them. I also included eBay as an interesting reference point. I could have included other competitors, but I, I didn't think that's fair. I think Amazon though and eBay, they're big enough that it's okay to kind of challenge them in this sort of setting. Um, <clears throat> but my, my hypothesis and my strategy that you should attack Amazon at the query level, um, in my opinion, comes comes true here. To explain what we're looking at, this is that same quadrant analysis um, format, and we can see that Amazon is, in any case, very strong, very dominant. We see them up and to the right, which is exactly where dominant players live in this framework. Um, but that said, they're much less dominant in the low funnel against uh, this office supplier than they are in the high funnel. And that's because this office supplier uses a query funneling structure. This was pioneered by uh, Martin Rutgeden, who spoke yesterday. Um, still one of the absolute brightest guys in the whole industry. Um, and yeah, they implement an approach here where basically they use um, a combination of negative keywords and campaign priority to send traffic to different places depending on the, on the query. Um, so. In this case, their funneling pattern, it's actually a, a rather basic one. I, I, you could do more sophisticated setups, um, but they look at generic traffic. Um, they look at brand traffic, which is traffic. There's a campaign for any traffic that contains a brand term. And then they have a more low funnel, if you can say that in whole shopping is a low funnel channel actually, but um, they have a more low funnel campaign which is for more specific queries that include, for example, um, color terms, numeric terms, uh, things like this. So that's that's the logic. And generic, if it doesn't have brands or a numeric pattern in there or anything like that, then it's gonna go into the generic, which is best described more as almost like a catch-all. Um, but we can see that um, Amazon is significantly less powerful in, that, in those low query environments. And that's great because um, the merchant, on the other hand, or the retailer, is much stronger in those areas. So the merchant is strong exactly where Amazon is weak, and the merchant is, is less present where Amazon is strong. So this is definitely, in, in my opinion, a very effective strategy for helping to differentiate yourself and which auctions you are appearing in when it comes to Amazon. Because they're, they're not going to take a complex, sophisticated approach like that. Things are, I'm sure their shopping participation is complex enough with the size of their business. And in the end, they just, they have the cash to just invest. Um, so I thought what would, and eBay, by the way, also rather interesting to see here. Um, they actually seem to have better impression share um, as you move down the funnel, which is interesting. But on the other hand, their outranking is not as strong. So it's kind of a contradiction in a way. 
Um, but I wanted to say, yeah, okay, this is interesting. So we drilled into, um, into a given account in a challenging industry, but what happens if we blow up this chart? And this is what I mean by that. So here we've, instead of looking at how Amazon is doing per query class, we're looking at how competitive Amazon is per query class per ad group. And in the case of this account, um, their ad groups are structured by product type level one. So they can, in other words, they can also see that in, for example, ink cartridges or office chairs or whichever product types they have, they can then see how competitive Amazon is um, in, in each case at each level of the query, uh, of the query funnel rather. So um, what we see generally speaking is that Amazon is quite strong and quite consolidated in the high funnel. This is no surprise. They're just bidding very high. I think they're entering an awful lot of more generic auctions and they're very strong in those auctions. Um, interestingly, when they get down to the mid funnel, you can already see that this is spreading out a bit and some opportunities are starting to open up. Remember, these are areas of opportunity that we see when you're landing in these other quadrants. And you can see which product types present a mid funnel opportunity against Amazon and you can act on that. And here we can see that in the low funnel, Amazon is most scattered and weakest. There are again, a lot of opportunities that open up in the low funnel for the, for the ag given ad groups. And what you can do then when you've identified these is you can say, okay, Amazon is killing me. But with these ad groups, I know, and in this query class, I know that Amazon is weak and I can go stronger there. This is an area where I should be more aggressive. I could increase my budget there, at, at least test it. It's a hypothesis that needs to be tested, of course. Um, so I also, while I was in there, um, this account, another thing that's interesting about it, not only has um, query campaign splits, it also uses device uh, splits as well. So device campaign splits. Um, <clears throat> and this is, bear in mind, a B2B office supplier. And so they tend to not push mobile as much. Um, from their perspective, desktop is a better place to be um, for their B2B users, for their business users who are typically shopping in the office or however. Um, so you can see that overall they have less ad groups active on mobile and tablet than they do over here on desktop. Um, and you can also see that Amazon is very strong um, in mobile and tablet. There's, there's a couple of opportunities out there, but it's very different. Desktop, um, Amazon is much more scattered it's clear they don't have a cohesive strategy here, a coherent strategy here. And there's significant opportunity in ad groups um, at the desktop, for, on the desktop device against Amazon. Now, my hypothesis for that or my assumption would be that Amazon is optimizing mobile first and they're not doing much or anything in the way of further device optimization. They're really targeting mobile and that's why they're so strong here then they're leaving desktop behind somehow. And so this is very valuable information um, for, for anyone who wants to compete against Amazon. You don't need to do a scatter plot to, um, to make this kind of stuff actionable. I just chose that to, to visualize it for you today. Um, but the reality is that you set your parameters. You set thresholds on outranking share, on overlap rate, um, potentially an impression share as well. I excluded impression share here because it would overwhelm the visualization, but you could do that, of course, in a tabular, in a table, a sheet. Uh, and then you can make this very actionable. You can make this, uh, this, this is information that everyone has. It's more reportable than ever in the Google Ads interface. Um, it's also now available, auction insights are available per retail category. Um, and I just think what's important here, auction, auction insights are nothing new, but I want to share this framework with you and help you understand that by segmenting, you can take this monolithic presence like Amazon, this huge whale, and you can discover that it does have soft spots on it. It does have weak spots that you can attack and where you can grow. Um, so the way forward, test and learn. You just need to try things out and test them. And uh, this is actually a different retailer, but um, for example, 
they ran a test, an ad group test based on low impression share, overperforming return on ad spend. Um, it's like, okay, I'm beating my rose targets anyway, perhaps by too much. Maybe I'm leaving some money on the table here if I would get a lower ROAS there. So they increased their, their budget um, and they were willing to accept lower return on advertising spend. And then they could, in the end, prove that they could capture both more impression share and more um, click share as well. And you could apply the same thing. You could check, okay, now how is my scatter plot or how, is, how are my auction insights evolving against um, Amazon or against whichever competitor? I think it's just important when you're dealing with marketplaces as a classic retailer, um, when you're dealing with marketplaces who might have a different business model than you and different means of approaching the auction, that you just need to be smart and targeted. And the same advice goes though for marketplaces. Don't be like Amazon, do better. Um, my, another statement I would make is um, that I find these kind of approaches most applicable on standard shopping campaigns. Uh, for example, the query sculpting approach, which is quite effective here, is not possible on smart shopping, just something to be aware of. Um, and before we move on, I have one more scatter plot. Uh, for if there's any single keyword ad group fans in the room, um, this is for a UK health and beauty retailer. I uh, just out of curiosity, um, scatter plotted their ad groups and um, so I just wanna point out that too, that if you're using a single keyword ad group structure, you can get some very interesting insights against Amazon or whichever competitor as well. Um, so what about pricing and margin? Because where I started this, there were a couple pieces of uh, tips, let's say I gave uh, last May about um, pursuing query sculpting um, and also about um, being integrating margin and, and bidding smarter in that regard. So <clears throat> this is a quote from uh, Jeff Bezos himself. This photo is so hilarious, I had to include it. I, hold on, let me try. I, I don't even know if I can do it, um, but keep this photo in mind because I have another photo coming soon and they're so different. Uh, but Jeff Bezos famously said, your margin is my opportunity, which is the most shark-like thing you can say. Um, and that was really a challenge to retailers, which he viewed as um, uh, basically a middleman. He wanted to cut them out. He wanted to bring brands and sellers and manufacturers directly to customers via a marketplace model. Um, but he's right. Your margin is exactly where you are weak against a competitor like Amazon. And <clears throat> Amazon's USPs, um, are built around things like great prices, great availability, great shipping. So it's super important to be smart about your pricing and about your margin and all these other topics going forward. And also as the Google Shopping channel generally gets more saturated, and when we look at these e-commerce trends like flattening year-over-year -year growth, um, it's just really important to be mindful of your pricing because Otherwise, it can get super painful. Um, so this is some analysis based on price benchmark data. I have it for um, German clients in three different industries. Um, this, bear in mind, is not the Google Merchant Center benchmark data, um, but that's this is a, a, a different source, but that data is available to basically anyone who wants it. You just have to opt in to the, the Market Insights program, um, and you can get that. And it's really important to understand, okay, what's going on? How do I stock, stack up? Your, your purchasing team, for example, or whoever sets your pricing, they might, they might think they know or they might indeed know how your pricing stacks up generally on the market, but it's important to look at the Google Shopping environment specifically when you're dealing in the channel. <clears throat> and yeah, this is just a, a histogram showing the distribution um, of of where prices deviate from the from the benchmark um, or from the from the average price, and by how much. And so here you can see I chose this one because um, they've got a super sharp peak here. Um, a lot, an awful lot of their products are right at the benchmark, which can be for different reasons, like perhaps brand enforced pricing or 
or stuff like that. And then they've got a, you know, if you take away that spike, it would be almost a bell curve. It's a pretty even distribution on either side. Um, so it doesn't look like they're pursuing a high or low pricing strategy. It seems they're trying to be on benchmark. Um, <clears throat> here is a fashion retailer who, ten, who has an awful lot that are at the maybe the manufacturer price or the brand price, but they also um, have a lot of items that are priced lower. Um, and it's good to be aware, okay, sure, maybe my pricing team knows that we're attractive on pricing, but do, do we in the channel and in the performance marketing teams, do we know that we're great on pricing there? It's very important to get that information because these are areas where, you know, if you combine that um, against other data about your competitors or marketplaces like Amazon, then you should, you can and should be more aggressive on those products. And these, this is a German, a German sports retailer who um, they've got a much greater diversity of, of pricing, but it tends to be um, good prices. They tend to have attractive pricing. Um, so that this is a, that, that's very important information to have. And you can make this actionable via custom label. That would be my recommendation. Um, I also want to mention that the Google benchmark pricing is available via BigQuery, which is awesome. You can connect with that, and then you can connect it to other data sources like your margin, for example. Um, and you might look at, okay, um, I've got uh, really great pricing here, but the margin is terrible. Do I? It's awesome that the price is attractive, but do I really want to push these low margin products? Or what ROAS target or other kind of efficiency or measurement target should I set for these? So then you, when you bring the profit in, you can have a much more kind of three-dimensional or round look at the topic than just price attractiveness alone. Um, and I also advise you to get serious about your pricing before Google gets serious about your pricing because I think they're going to do exactly that. Um, this is from the content API for buy on Google. Uh, it's a dynamic repricing in the pipeline and um, I think it's pretty interesting here because they they used to have a, a, a strategy called win buy box which is particular to the to the Google shopping marketplace called buy on Google um, but now they replaced it with stats based and cost of goods sold sold based strategies um, and a cost of goods sold based strategy would be exactly that would somehow be balancing margin or, or it'd be a margin informed dynamic repricing strategy um, now I mentioned this because yeah, this is currently only available or will be available in Google's marketplace. And these will be side by side with standard shopping PLAs. They will cannibalize that traffic. They will not go to merchant landing pages because it's a marketplace experience. They'll go right through a special interface, a little widget there on the Google search engine result page. Um, and although Buy on Google hasn't rolled out in Europe yet, it's only in beta in France, um, it could be big in another one or two years. It's something that we need to, to all have on our radar. How much do we want to participate? What will be smart to opt in? And also to what extent does this threaten my business model? Um, and I strongly assume that dynamic repricing will come to shopping as well. They've got this basic technology of how to reprice. The challenging part, excuse me, that's just a reminder about my time. The challenging part is actually to then sync that up with uh, your landing page so that your landing page is dynamically refreshed. Um, just regarding margin, I'll go through this quickly since we're short on time. I love this quote and look how friendly this guy looks compared to Jeff Bezos. Um, it's tempting if the only tool you have is a hammer to treat everything as if it were a nail. This is called the law of the instrument. And this is so often the case in Google Shopping, in Google Ads generally, um, that we think of everything as a ROAS problem and not everything is a ROAS problem. And actually, ROAS sucks. It's not a good metric. It, let me explain. Um, ROAS is always going to be curved. That's okay. There's going to be all of your marketing efforts will, the incrementality of your marketing budget will always have this curve baked into it. That's fine. But it's a challenging problem. And with ROAS, it's really hard to optimize the best way possible on that curve. ROAS represents basically 
a margin of error around your actual profitability. ROAS is just a model of your profitability. And I question how many people have really taken a super serious approach, a really data informed approach to modeling their return on ad spend, or how many picked a number because of what a partner told them or what they read in a blog post. It doesn't mean that return on ad spend is actually profitable to you. And I think about this as basically fat that can be trimmed. When you're trying to optimize on a budget curve so that your budget is still incremental, um, you need to just trim the fat. That's the best thing that you can do. And when you're competing against marketplaces um, that are potentially very uninterested in if their campaigns are really profitable or not, they, they're just pursuing extremely aggressive growth, that's a, it's dangerous to be shoulder to shoulder with those people. They're big, they can really bump you around. And if they don't care about profit, um, you need to be really careful. So I recommend optimizing based on profit in order to survive that. This allows you to be as effective as possible with these strategies that we've discussed before at a query level, on a device level. Finding, identifying weak spots in competitors, uh, like Amazon, for example, and then pursuing those opportunities that will show up and pursuing the weak spots with the maximum regression while still knowing that you're profitable, not guessing that you're profitable, profitable because of return on ad spend. Um, so that's, I like to make that speech as often as I can. Please move to profit-based <laughs> bidding, profit-based campaign management, profit-based goal setting. Um, I can highly recommend that. And in summary, I think that these could be challenging years ahead. Everyone has been kind of in e-commerce. We've all been patting ourselves on the back because actually our businesses often grew a lot during and because of COVID-19. But now we're on the other side of that. Um, regarding marketplaces, just a reminder that they do not work like classic retailers. It is a different animal. Um, if you are a marketplace, implementation can be quite tedious, challenging, even risky. So please seek help. Um, please, please ask for help from Google or from a qualified agency partner. And um, the key here in the end, it's all about differentiation at this point in the Google shopping environment. How can I differentiate? How can I be smarter, more agile than my competitors? You and all your competitors might all be using Target ROAS. How can you use Target ROAS better than those people? That's the question that I would ask. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for this excellent presentation. And uh, we saw a lot of these, um, these diagrams. That was uh, awesome.